ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to week eight of Robbie T. Interviews. My guest today is former Notre Dame, North Carolina, FAU, and SMU basketball coach, Mr. Matt Dory. Coach, welcome to the show. Thanks so much right. for being here. All right, thank you very much, Robbie. I'm excited to be on the show and uh, honored that you'd have me. So uh, I hope everything is going well. I know we're doing crazy in crazy times. How's everything by you? Yes, good. I live outside of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, in a town called Mooresville, which is uh, close to Davidson College. And I say that because uh, Bob McKillop is the head coach of Davidson and was my high school coach at Holy Trinity right down the road from you. Yes. Uh, with that said, uh, we've done fine through this pandemic. Knock on wood, our family's been healthy. Our kids have been home. And, um, you know, with the rioting and civil unrest, a lot of that has happened in downtown Charlotte, which is about 30 miles from me. Yeah. As long as everybody's safe, that's what matters, right? That's right. Yep. Okay, so let's start with your uh, college days. Uh, you play at North Carolina under Dean Smith. Uh, what was it like playing under such a legendary coach? Yeah, it, you know what? <clears throat> I was very fortunate, Robbie, uh, at a young age to be coached uh, by good coaches. Uh, that started at St. Raphael's uh, down the road, CYO. Yep. Uh, I had the Coleman brothers, were two gentlemen that coached us. And then I went to Holy Trinity High School and played for Bob McKillop. My first two years, then Dick Zeitler, who uh, we won the state championship in 1980. And, and, and then in addition to that, in the summers, I'd always go to camp. And I went to Gus Alfieri's camp at, at St. Anthony's High School. I went to Reverend Vischer's camp at Long Island Lutheran. Uh, and the coaches that worked those camps were some of the best high school coaches on Long Island. And I was blessed to have terrific coaches. And a lot of them were first-generation New York City guys that moved out to Long Island. So they really understood, you know, the games, the fundamentals. And um, uh, I was just blessed. And, and so, so that gave me a great foundation to play under the legendary Dean Smith because he appreciated all those things that those coaches instilled in me and basically fundamentals, you know, can you, can you run hard? Do you play hard? Do you hustle? Can you box out? Do you play help side defense? Do you share the basketball? Do you shoot the ball with proper technique? And so I had a real good baseline and, and it's a real credit to the coaches that I had in Nassau County. Wow. So uh, question to you, we all, know what Dean Smith was like on the court, but what was he like off the court? Uh, he's, he was such a smart man, Robbie. Um, <clears throat> he could have done anything. He could have been the pastor of a big church. He could have been the CEO of a large corporation, uh, a very smart man who knew how to, um, he was well-read, and, and, and really could understand what makes a person tick. Yeah. And I think that he had such a good side to him. Anybody that met Coach Smith was usually amazed by his kindness um, and then his memory. If you would have met Coach Smith at a random event and then ran into him at LaGuardia Airport five years later, He'd come up to you and say, hey, Robbie, how you doing? Are you still doing your podcast? Yeah. And it would blow you away. Yeah. That, that, that's the type of memory, like photographic memory that he had. So not only did you play under legendary coach Dean Smith, you also had the opportunity to play alongside arguably the greatest basketball player of all time, Michael Jordan. Can you discuss what that was like and what he uh, brought to the table? Yeah, Robbie. Um, well, when I got to North Carolina, we had a great player in Al Wood. Yeah. We had a, I had a great uh, player, Jimmy, uh, uh, James Worthy, who was a year ahead of me. And then we had Jimmy Black, a point guard from Cardinal Hayes in the Bronx. Um, Sam Perkins from Brooklyn um, and I were in the same class. And then this, this kind of punk freshman comes in. His name's Mike Jordan. And you saw immediately – 
his physique, his shoulders, his long arms, mm -hmm. uh, his confidence, uh, but his talent. I mean, he had the gift that someone like Dr. J would have growing up on Long Island. You know, I was always amazed at Dr. J's ability to leave the floor and create a shot under the basket. Well, Michael had that same gift. He could jump on one side of the basket and double pump and come out on the other side and find a window to shoot the ball through and off the glass with touch. Uh, it, it was an amazing thing to witness. And um, I think the world has gotten to see it again in replay with the, the, uh, the last dance that was on ESPN for about five weeks straight. Yeah. What'd you think about that, that, that documentary? It was, uh, it was really terrific. I, I think the things that I appreciated <clears throat> were probably threefold. One, Michael's ability to get through his day yeah. and everything he had to deal with, you know, from autographs to interviews to commercials uh, to the court and focus on the task at hand. I was really impressed with Phil Jackson's ability to manage the personalities on that team. Yes. And then how Jerry Ryan, not Jerry Reinsdorf, but Jerry Krause was so adamant at tearing that team apart and, and creating some unnecessary animosity from the players and the coaches. And I really had fun watching that documentary. I learned so many things I didn't know. Yeah. So, like I asked before about Dean Smith, we all knew what Michael was like on the court, but what was he like off the court? Michael was off the court what, well, <clears throat> I was going to say well, off the court, he's what like he is on the court. You know, great energy and competitive. Yeah. But off the court, he's a little more uh, playful, very playful, very love to tease, love to compete, whether it be a card game, a pool game. Um, uh, love to pick. I mean, you got to have thick skin around him because he's going to bust yeah. your chops. And if you can't handle it, you know, you need to leave the room now. Yeah. So, yeah, he, he was a, a, a great – always was always in a good mood. I think that's something that I really admire is that he was, he was always – has positive energy. So what, what was the main thing you think that separated Michael from the others? Well, first of all, it comes down to talent. But yeah. um, some people have talent. Not everybody maximizes the talent. So it, it takes a work ethic. It takes a intelligence because he was a very smart player. So Jack Welch, who was the former CEO of GE, Robbie, um, wrote a book. And, and he talked about the four qualities that he looked for in an employee. And the first one was energy. Can yeah. you bring energy to the workplace? The second one was, can you energize others? The third was, can you execute? Can you do your job? And then the fourth one, can you do it with an edge? Because sometimes it's not going to be easy. There's going to be opposition. There's going to be competition. Mm -hmm. And are you willing to, you know, I usually say, throw that elbow. To, to get that loose ball. And Michael, Michael Jordan did all four of those, Robbie. Execute, I mean, energy, brought great energy. He could energize others. He, he, he executed with an edge, and he did all four of those at the highest level. Yeah. Maybe the, maybe the NBA has ever seen. You still talk to Michael today? I, I do. I text him once in a while, uh, yeah. probably once, or tw once a month or so. and. Um, he made the news yesterday by catching a big marlin off the coast of North Carolina, the yes. big rock fishing tournament. He had his boat out there called Catch 23. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, everything's, everything's got the vanity plate. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I, I communicate with him maybe once uh, or so, once a month or once every two months. Nice. Well, at North Carolina, you were lucky enough to win a national championship, defeating Georgetown 83-82. Uh, can you take us through that day? What was it like for you and your team? And ultimately, what was it like to fight on the biggest stage in college basketball? 
Well, it, it, the, the good thing is we had been in the final game the year before. So yeah. we had experience. Um, the starting five, except for Michael, played significant minutes the year before. So it was, you know, it was exciting. It's certainly exciting being in the French quarters, you know, and the anticipation. But we weren't really overly, I don't want to say nervous, like we weren't super nervous. We were excited. Um, the thing I remember is the first time the game was played in a domed arena. That was the first time that the Final Four was in a domed arena, Robbie. And <clears throat> that was weird because, you know, you, the, the year before the Final Four was in the Spectrum in Philadelphia, and you'd run from your locker room about 25 yards to the court. Well, now you were running from a locker room to the court, and it felt like you were running a mile. Like you, you want to jog out there, jog out there. And like, yeah. you, you felt like you wanted to find a park bench and sit down for a few minutes before you went the rest of the way. That's one. And then two, the fans were so far away. You know, I, I, I prefer a smaller intimate environment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You felt such a disconnect to the fans. Like it's almost a delayed reaction to a play on the court. Uh, that I didn't particularly like, but, you know, they do it for the money. Uh, I get it. And, um, but I, I thought, I, 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 I thought it was cool that we were in the first game in the domed arena, first yeah. final four, but I still not, not as big a fan of it. So besides winning a championship, of course, what is one of your favorite memories of playing at North Carolina? I, I think just being around the guys, you, you miss the, the relationships. We had great players, but we had great guys. Yeah. From Michael Jordan to James Worthy to Jimmy Black to Al Wood to Brad Darty, Kenny Smith, I go on and on. All just good guys and, and, and successful guys in their own right. Uh, I miss the camaraderie. Um, I miss walking on campus. I miss, I miss – you know, so much I miss. There's not much you don't miss except exams. That's the only thing I do. I, 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 don't, I don't miss. Yep. I won't miss it when I graduate high school either. <laughs> <laughs> so after graduating North Carolina, at that moment, what were your goals for your future? Well, I thought I was going to play in the NBA. And so um, the hardest day probably of my life at that point was uh, the draft was June of eight, 1984. So I graduated, stuck around Chapel Hill, thought I was going to get drafted in the top three rounds and play in the NBA. Mm -hmm. And uh, the draft occurred. I was speaking at a camp in, in at Campbell College in North Carolina. And... Uh, you know, the draft wasn't that big of a deal back then. And I kept putting quarters in the phone to dial the Coach, coach Smith's office and, and ask for Linda Woods, who was his secretary uh, at the time, and uh, who ironically became my secretary when I became the head coach. And I'd ask, hey, any word yet? You know, because we didn't have cell phones. Yeah. You know, I'm getting ready to speak at this camp. No word, no word, no word. So I go out and speak to the campers and the coach, in the, and there's like 700 campers there. In the middle of the lecture, the director of the camp <clears throat> taps me on the shoulder and says, Cleveland Cavaliers, sixth round. And I did everything I could in my power, Robbie, to keep myself from crying yeah, because I felt like I was going to be drafted in the third round, at least, mm -hmm. if not better. So it was a devastating day to make it worse. The next day I wake up to the alarm back then they had alarm clocks that <laughs> were radio alarm clocks. So the alarm goes off and right away goes to sports. And in local sports, ACC players drafted in the NBA, and it goes down the list, and it gets to the 
second round and gets to the third round and says, Rick Carlisle drafted by the Boston Celtics. And Rick and I were contemporaries and were <clears throat> played against each other and became friends. And we worked out in the preseason. Um, and he got the spot that I wanted. I mean, that's where I wanted to get drafted if it wasn't the Knicks. Yeah. And um, I, I remember crying like a baby in my bed, like, why? Yeah. And it was like a, it was like a long lost, long girl, long time girlfriend breaking up with you. Like, it, it was really hard. So um, I ended up getting cut. I hurt my back, got cut, wasn't good enough, and went to work in New York City on Wall Street. So I'm assuming you're a Celtics fan. What's that? I'm assuming you're a Celtics fan. I was at the time, yeah. I mean, I was a Larry Bird fan. I'm a diehard Celtics fan. Yeah, I, I, I was. I was a huge Bird fan, and uh, you know, loved the way they those teams played. Yeah. When he was there, and um, you know, the way they passed the ball and cut, and. Um, you know, thought that I could have fit into that style of play. But yeah. I just was – I wasn't good enough. The bottom line is I wasn't good enough. So, um, yeah, so that was hard. That was a hard, hard day. Yeah. Very, yeah. very painful day for me. Yeah. All right. Now let's move to uh, your assistant coaching years. Uh, you were first an assistant at Davidson, and then you were an assistant at Kansas under Roy Williams. Uh, awesome. What did Coach Williams teach you, and how did this help your career in the long run? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> I was doing the radio at Davidson. I, I I left my job in New York, quit Wall Street, moved to Charlotte, thought I was going to get in the real estate business, and then I started coaching an AAU team. I did the radio at Davidson. They fired their coach and hired Bob McKillop. Yeah. And so Bob hired me. Bob had been an assistant there um years earlier so he hired me we were there three years and then um roy williams was looking for an assistant and having played for him when he was an assistant at north carolina uh, made sense and so i joined um his staff i think the things that i learned from coach williams was really how to run a program how to be organized, how to um, have a system, not only of the way you play, but the way you run practice, um, job descriptions for your assistants, for your secretaries, um, you know, just just being able to run a program. And, yeah. you know, it's not just showing up at practice and rolling out the balls. It's you know, how do you organize camp, how do you, you know, organize – preseason how do you you know there's there's lists for everything so I was there for seven years so I got uh, a, a first-hand look at how he did it nice so moving to your first full-time head coaching job at Notre Dame how did you come about to get that job yeah well first of all um I had turned down a couple of jobs and and uh and, you know, I didn't want to just be a head coach to be a head coach because yeah. they're hard jobs. And I had Coach Smith and Coach Williams advising me. And I think it was the year before where the St. Louis job opened up and I couldn't even get an interview. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, maybe I waited too long. Yeah. And then the next year, Notre Dame opened up. And... um not only did I get the interview, I obviously got the job. And it was really fascinating. An Irish Catholic kid from Long Island who played at St. Rayfield's yeah. and Holy Trinity to be at Notre Dame. And I remember my mother coming out with my dad for the press conference. And we were walking the campus. And she grabbed my arm as we walked up on the, um, on, on the Golden Dome. And she said, you know, Matthew, she call, you know, called me by my full first name. You know, you know, Matthew, if you couldn't be a Catholic priest, being the head coach at Notre Dame is a close second. <laughs> and, <yeah. That's laughs> and, and, she, and she meant it, Robbie. She meant it. So, um, so, yeah, I think I got it because of fit. I got it because of 
Coach Williams' success. Yeah. And 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 I, I think I got it because you know I I I sold them and they sold me and ironically the person who did a lot of the hiring or ran the process was Bubba Cunningham who's now the AD at Notre Dame yeah. I mean North Carolina at North Carolina. <clears throat> What was it like being a first-time head coach? Was it nerve-wracking, like stepping onto the court for that first time? No, it really wasn't. I mean, it was, it was butterflies. Yeah. But I felt confident in what we were doing, and I think that's the experience I had from all those years of being around great coaches as a player, then working for Bob McKillop and and Roy Williams. I was confident that what we were going to do was sound. Um, the players were responsive. They bought in. Uh, you know, anytime you step on the court and the ball is getting ready to go up, you have normal nerves. Yeah. But in terms of overall, like I felt we were going to be okay. And once the ball went up, man, it was it was it was, it was, it was, it was, it was like that's where I belonged. Yeah, it's like it's like these interviews. Once I get the uh, introduction done, it's all all good. Yeah, just uh, like having a conversation, right? Yeah. Well, you do a good job with your homework, by the way. You're asking very astute questions. Oh, thank you, Coach. Yep, yep. Uh, so what was one of your favorite moments while coaching at Notre I think, uh, well, the press conference with my family being there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, beating Ohio State at Ohio State, which was the first w- game we played. They were ranked fifth in the country. Um, beating them. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. And having my son in my arms after the game in an interview with Bill Raftery on ESPN. Um, <clears throat> we beat UConn at UConn. We beat UConn at home. Those were two big wins. St. John's at home, Seton Hall on the road. We had five top 25 wins. Wow. Um, and we played in New York three different times. We played in the preseason NIT, the, the Big East tournament, and the postseason NC. Uh, the postseason NIT. So we were like, I love playing in the garden. I think coaching in the garden was awesome. Uh, obviously, a lot of Notre Dame fans there. And uh, it, it was really cool to be be in Madison Square Garden. Yeah, greatest arena in the world. <laughs> yep, that's right. So after coaching at Notre Dame for a season, uh, you were lucky enough to receive the head coaching job at your alma mater, North Carolina. Uh, what was that experience right. like for you? Yeah, it was. Uh, it, there's a lot of ups and downs, uh, Robbie. I think first, you know, I didn't think I'd get the job. I thought that Roy Williams would take it. And when he turned it down, it it fell to me. And it was an awkward time because the job opened up in late June, <clears throat> where most coaches take over in in March or April. Yeah. So I was really behind the eight ball in recruiting, developing relationships with. Um, the, the staff that was behind, the secretaries, um, the players, uh, it, was, it was an awkward time. Um, and where Notre Dame wanted change and embraced change, with me coming in and bringing my staff and our personalities, North Carolina didn't really want change. They, they had Coach Smith there for 36 years. They had Bill Guthridge for another three. Yeah. You know, and I came in, and even though I'd played there for them, I represented really change because I wasn't there as an assistant, and I brought my own assistants with me. And we started making change to the physical plant, you know, just cleaning up the office, changing the locker room. And some people took offense to that. So I think that was really hard. Uh, We had a good first season. We were ranked number one in the country, won the ACC regular season championship. Yeah. Tied tied with Duke, but we got the nod because we we had beaten them uh, and beat Maryland twice that year. So uh, we were the number one seed in the ACC tournament. Uh, We were the number two seed in the NCAA tournament. Uh, We prematurely bowed out of the NCAAs, but it was a hard time because – you know, the expectations were through the roof and Coach Smith and Coach Guthridge were still there. Yeah. And so it really was a challenge to 
my lack of leadership skills because I was such an inexperienced head coach. Yeah. Was winning the regular season title one of your favorite moments or was there something else? Uh, you know, yeah, I think, well, beating Duke at Duke was really fun. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, we beat Maryland. Winning, winning on the road is fun. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're at a place like North Carolina because everybody's jacked up. Yeah. So we beat, we beat, uh, you know, heck, we were, we only lost two games. No, we lost more than that uh, in the AC, in the regular season, but beating Duke at Duke, wake, wake at wake, wake was a top 20 team. Yeah. Uh, beat Maryland at Maryland. <clears throat> um, that's always fun. Beating UVA at UVA. No, we lost at UVA. I take that back. I think we, I think we lost at UVA. So, you know, winning on the road is a lot of fun. Uh, beat Florida state, at Florida state. I think we did. Uh, so yeah, we had, I, th I think, I think the, the Duke at Duke was a big win. UCLA, we beat UCLA at UCLA. Um, you know, so, yeah, those were, those were, those were, you know, a lot of great moments. Um, yeah. And then the next year we weren't very good. And I knew we weren't because I knew it was in the pipeline of recruiting. Yeah. And then the third year we were building and we had a great start. We started off going, going on a tear and, and we weren't ranked to being ranked like 12th in the country and we uh in the preseason nit beat kansas in the garden roy williams that was a really cool experience yeah remember my mom was sitting behind the bench robbie and we were up at halftime by 10 points and she comes up to me she goes matthew congratulations and i'm like mom it's only halftime <laughs> You gotta love moms, yeah. And uh, so that was that was cool. But then yeah. Sean May, Sean May broke his foot, and uh, as a result, we fell short of making the NCAA tournament. And I I was asked to leave, so that was hard. Well, also uh, also while you were at North Carolina, you were lucky enough to win the uh, AP Coach of the Year in two thousand one. Uh, what was that award uh, like for your career? Had that well, I still have it behind me. You know, you see it up there on the wall. Uh, uh, yep. on the, yep. And behind that is a picture of Dr. J and my brother and I. That's awesome. Uh, Dr. J being the Roosevelt native. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a great award. You'd rather win a national championship. Yes. Um, and it's really a team award. It's a, it's a staff award. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, without the players performing, you don't get the trophy. Absolutely. So, you know, it's really a team award. Yeah. So after North Carolina, you went on to coach FAU and SMU. Uh, what are those experience, how those experience is help your career? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, people, when they, you know, if I speak somewhere or, doing a podcast and they say, you know, they give my resume and they say, yeah, assistant coach at Davidson, Kansas, head coach at Notre Dame, head coach at North Carolina. They go head coach at FAU, head coach at SMU. And I, 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 I kind of laugh. I said, yeah, you know, think about that. Yeah. Like, that's not a typical, you know, career arc. And, and so I was at a coaching for two years. I was doing some TV. I was living down here in Mooresville, outside of Charlotte. And I enjoyed my life. I mean, looking back, my wife and I sometimes talk about, you know, maybe I should have just stayed, uh, you know, in that role because that's kind of what I'm doing now, private business and, and media. Um, but I really felt like I needed a coach again. And I had one of my players who's now an assistant at Notre Dame, Ryan Humphrey. He called me and he said, I remember being in my car. I remember where I pulled off. He's like, coach, you're a good coach. You need to be coaching. Yeah. And, and then I took FAU and FAU is a bad job, but I wanted to coach and I didn't want to wait too long because then I didn't want to miss out and not get hired. Yeah. So I took that job. And what I realized is I did like to coach, you know, it's, it's easy to like to coach at Notre Dame and North Carolina. Yeah. 
But our first exhibition game, Robbie, we probably had 20 people at the game. And Rex Walters was one of my assistants. And Rex uh, played in the NBA and played at Kansas and, you know, been, been around big-time basketball. And I said to the team, the, the coaches, you know, as we went in after the first warm-up, I said, how do you guys feel about only 25 people being in the stands? And we all, to a man, said we didn't care. You know, I had the same butterflies in my gut as I did before I coached against Duke. Yeah. It's just less people were watching. And, and what I learned about that year was coaching basketball is coaching basketball. If you really love the game and want to make an impact on the lives of young men, it doesn't matter where you are. Yeah. And so I thought that was really kind of refreshing for me to kind of have that realization. Yeah. So after you, uh, your tenure at SMU, uh, you left Division One coaching altogether. Uh, where did your travels lead you after that? Yeah. Um, I kind of got fed up with the college game because it was getting to be a little bit uh, dirty or more dirty. And I said, you know what, I'm going to try to go to the NBA. And I started scouting with the hopes of getting a front office, you know, moving up in the front office. And I was with the Pacers for five years. Ironically, we talked earlier about the Celtics. Yep. Larry Bird was the president. He yep. signed my checks. And so, you know, that was a great experience. But at, after five years, I realized I really wasn't getting ready to move up. You know, there's not a lot of job security in the NBA. Yeah. So I quit my job and, and moved to the Atlantic 10, thinking I'd get into, you know, front office work in, in college athletics, like an AD and a commissioner. Um, and I did that for about a year and a half, and I, I really didn't like it. I was away from my family. And, again, just advancement. And the college game's not in a good place right now. And so I left, and I got into private business. I've been doing it for about a year. Um, it seems like longer. Yeah, a little longer than a year. Coach, what do you mean by the college team is not in a good position right now? Um, that's a great question. Just it's, it's messy. You know, the transfer rules, yeah. the name, image, and likeness where kids are going to be getting paid um, for, you know, which is fine, you know, whether you agree with it or not. It's just, it's chaos. It's chaos. It's hard to build the program. Um, you know, back then there was a lot of, and there still is, the underbelly of college athletics is not pretty, you know, with the agents, uh, you know, the recruiting. Um, it, it's not pretty. And so, you know, kids, kids, you know, looking to go pro after a year, the one and done, it just not, I don't, I don't know many coaches that are really enjoying coaching college basketball. So you wouldn't want to coach again? I, I think I'm done. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm done. And I had to come to that realization, Robbie, um, a year ago, a little over a year ago, I was interviewing for a job that I thought I, you know, should get. And the AD went in a different direction. And as soon as he texted me that he was going in a different direction, I got down on my knees and thanked God for not giving me that job. Yeah. Because sometimes we do things because we feel that's what other people expect us to do. Mm -hmm. And in our heart, we don't necessarily maybe want to do that. And I think that I was doing it probably for the wrong reasons because I think people expect me to do it. Or even if you're good at it, doesn't mean you should do it. I remember sitting on a plane one time and I'm sitting across from a guy. We start talking. He said, you know, what do you do? I said, I coach basketball. He said, why do you do it? And maybe at this time I was at SMU and I'm like, well, I'm, I guess I'm good at it. He says, is that good enough reason? Yeah. I, I thought that was pretty enlightening. It is, yeah. So, so yeah, I don't miss it, really. You know, I don't miss it. I'm fulfilled with business. I do some per, uh, executive coaching. Uh, I do a radio show yeah. uh, a couple times a week. Um, I get to make my own schedule. 
Yeah. And I don't have to be, I, I do, I've gotten fired before and I don't want to get fired again. Yeah. So I'm in control of my life now. You know, yeah. it's on me. And, yeah. and so, uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty fulfilled right now. Amen. That's all, that's all that matters, you know? That's right. So you have accomplished so much in your career. Uh, going forward, is there anything else you'd like to accomplish? Well, yeah, I'd like to be a successful businessman. Um, you know, what does that look like? You know, does that mean you're making money? Does that mean you're building a business? Is that, I, I think, uh, you know, I'd like to be a successful businessman. What does that mean? Yeah. I don't know what the, what that looks like. I think I know what it feels like to me. It'll, you know, and that's the neat thing about what I'm doing. I'm not really being measured by anybody but me yeah. where no one else can really determine my success or how they make me, they can't make me feel like a success or a failure. And I think that now it's like, yeah, I feel good about what I did. I feel good about how I'm providing for my family. Um, I'm proud of, of dealing with the, you know, the valleys in my life, you know, um, and people have had worse valleys than me, but from a career standpoint, you have high highs and low lows. So what do I want the next, I'm 58, you know, what I want the next 12, 12 years to look like, you know, I hope I am fulfilled with my job. I hope that, you know, our kids are healthy yeah. and, um, you know, we put them in position to be successful and that I can, make a good enough living that, you know, I can enjoy around the golf and I'll be healthy enough. And, but I don't ever want to stop working because I like to learn. Yeah. I like to compete. And in business, you're competing, you know, every day I'm basically in sales and, you know, I like to win and I like the feeling of winning. And so when you complete a transaction, um, yeah. that's, that's a win. Yeah. And and it's the same feeling you get when you win a, win a game. Just less people are watching. <laughs> yeah, I like that. So I know you have a media background. You're a commentator for the ACC Network. And then you also do radio shows like you mentioned before. Uh, as an aspiring bro uh, broadcaster, hopefully in the future, what advice would you give me? I think just doing what you're doing is practice. Yeah. You know, and and. No more games you can do the more interviews you can do and then watch those interviews okay and, and break them down like you would a game film like what did i do well like you you went off script a few minutes ago and you asked me a question based on my answer yeah. like i thought that was really good of you Thank versus you. just being stuck to your script and and because a lot of times i'm not answering your questions right or maybe i'm answering i talk longer some people some interviewers interviewees don't talk enough yeah so you're you're constantly having to ask questions and then there's people maybe like me that i'll talk longer than you anticipated and i might go ahead and answer the fourth question you have listed in the first answer right yes so now you have to be able to adjust without looking flustered or uncomfortable and i think you've done that Thank you. um you know uh listening like taking like you and i talked earlier right you know let's condense this let's make it 30 to 40 minutes because i don't think people want to see more than 40 minutes of this gray hair guy from <laughs> East you know um let's not let's keep it short let's want to want more um and then finding a mentor, you know, somebody maybe retired who would love to take you under their wing and say, hey, you know, let me look at some of your films. Let me work with you. You know, just studying it. Yeah. You know, like you're, you're in the Mecca, man. You, you got Mike Breen right down the road. Like Mike Breen's one of my favorite, you know. Yeah, uh, Mike, Mike Breen is my mentor. Yeah, I met Mike a couple months ago at MSG. Uh, he was so kind, came over. I told him about my story and he t told me some very inspiring advice. So, yeah. 
You look like, though, you look like an old announcer, Tim, with your glasses and your coloring. Your, your glasses are, are cool. You got good glasses. Yeah, the Nathan Lane glasses. Huh? <laughs> Nathan Lane, the actor, wears, wears glasses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that uh, uh, Tim, I'm trying to remember his name, but I think just practicing and studying and asking people for help uh, to get better, some, and then, and then pra just practice, 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 and study the film. Study yeah. this film. What, can, what did I do well? How can I get better? Thank you, Coach. It means a lot. Well, yeah. so what advice would you give to uh, young kids aspiring to play college basketball? Yeah, I think uh, the fundamentals. The fundamentals. You got to – the game will be always about fundamentals. And it's, it's more about fundamentals than ever before. Yeah. Because if you can pass, handle, and shoot the ball, you can play. I mean, look at Steph Curry. He can pass, handle, and shoot the ball. He sure can. He can play. And he's not bigger than anybody else. He's not stronger than anybody else. He's not faster than anybody else. But he can pass, handle, and shoot the ball. And then lastly, and this is hard, but have confidence in yourself. Yep. And that's developed through repetition. Confidence is key. But don't let anybody punk you. Don't let anybody make you feel you're not good enough. Yep. And that's where the Long Island needs to come out in you. And you say, screw you, I'll show you. That's great advice, Coach. Thank you very much. So now I'm going to do something called the lightning round. I do it every interview. It, it, quick questions, one word answers. These are fun questions, all right? Okay. All right. Question number one. Favorite sport besides basketball? Golf. Ooh, nice. You play golf a lot? I, I like to, yeah. <laughs> I never really played. All right. Favorite professional basketball team? <laughs> I got to say the Pacers. I worked there for for s five years. Pacers. Yeah, they're still a tough team today. So well coached. Yeah. yeah. All right, here's a two-parter. Hardest team you've played against and hardest team you've coached against. Hardest team I've played against, Indiana. Nice. With Isaiah Thomas. Yep. Uh, we lost in the national championship game. Hardest team I coached against. Uh, you know, have to probably have to say Duke. Yeah, I was. I was going to think you. Should, I was thought you should say that. Yeah. <laughs> Favorite movie. Favorite movie. <laughs> Favorite movie. Ah oh, man. I don't know if I just have one favorite movie. I guess I should just because yeah. you get this question once in a while. Yeah. What's your favorite movie? Um I'm I mean, embarrassed. How about one of the top five? What? How about one of the top five? Yeah, I think um uh, I like anything Denzel Washington. Oh uh, yeah, he's great. He's great. Morgan Freeman. Yes. Um, you know, uh, I, I like, I'll tell you what, Goodfellas. <laughs> that's a great that's Long Island. And that's yeah. when I was growing up. That was going on right down, right, right down. Joe Pesci. <laughs> Joe Pesci was the best. Yeah. Tommy Two Tones, yeah. Uh, favorite food? Uh, Italian food. Yeah, I love pizza. Yeah. <laughs> he does it, right? right? Favorite musician? Favorite musician? Probably uh, Bruce Springsteen. Oh, good one. Yeah. And, and then Alicia Keys, but don't tell my wife. <laughs> She's great, though, really. Yeah. I like old music, too. Yeah. All right, here's a question that people uh, seem to love. If your life was a movie, what would it be called and who would play you? Woo! Yeah. Um, all right. 
Ups and Downs, starring Ben Affleck. Nice. I like that. Ben yes, Affleck. He just, he, he just played a basketball coach yes. in a movie. That was phenomenal. And, and uh, you know, with basketball, you have a lot of ups and downs and yeah. as a career. Yeah. And finally, best interviewer in New York. <clears throat> best what? Interviewer in New York. <laughs> Man, that's, that's a tough one. That's a tough one, Robbie. Huh. You got Mike Green. You got, uh, how about Robbie? How about Robbie Tribal? Thanks, Coach. Well, that concludes our interview. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been a joy. You've been great. Thank uh, you. And thank you for adjusting uh, the length. I appreciate that. Oh, I no thought problem. that was appropriate. Maybe, Maybe I can have you again on in the future. Yes, sir. Please uh, do. Thanks, thanks everyone, for watching. Uh, until next week, I'm Robbie Twible. Take care, everybody.